talking about it with Naomi this morning when we pulled in. It's a little different setting uh, than I'm used to uh, to having and to preaching. Uh, we live there in the mountains, and uh, we're just a little country church, just a little mountain church. And uh, there have been times when I've pulled in the parking lot and had more turkeys in the yard than we did folk in the pews. Um, I was preaching one, one Sunday evening and just happened to look out the window and saw a big bobcat come up on the, uh, over the hill and sit down in the parking lot and just completely lost my train of thought. And uh, every now and then I'll be preaching and I'll see everybody kind of turn and look and I'll lose their attention. I know there's deer out in the cemetery walking around. So a uh, little different, but it's good to be with you. And um, I was thinking this morning, I don't use a microphone. Uh, the church I pastor, the folk told me when I came there, they said, as long as you're pastor, one thing's for sure, we won't have to spend any money on sound equipment. And uh, so I try to be careful with that. I don't want to blow your ears out, um, but uh, I am just what I am. I'm not anything different uh, here than I will be at home. Um, again, I appreciate the, the kind invitation to come. I've enjoyed uh, the time so far in getting to, to know your pastor and uh, thank God for him and thankful that I can call him and count him a friend and uh, just from talking to him and fellowshipping with him I sense that he really has a heart for this church and for you as a people and I can sense his love uh, for you just in talking with him and fellowshipping with him mm -hmm. and I thank God for that I've sat down with some preachers uh, some pastors in particular, and by the time we got done talking, I thought to myself, why in the world is that man at that church, and why in the world have they kept him around? They don't like each other. They can't stand each other. They've got nothing good to say about each other, but that's not the case uh, here, and I thank God for how he's put you together, and uh, we bless the Lord for that. I know that you have met Brother Brandon Harrell. You have met Brother Vincent Troxell, and they're my friends. Don't hold that against me. Uh, I'm just kidding. They're two of my favorite preachers, and I'm thankful that I can count them as friends, and they've been dear friends to me uh, down through the years of ministry. Uh, Brother Brandon Harrell and myself grew up together and uh, went to the same church. Uh, sadly, also hung out in the same pool hall until God, by His grace, saved us and changed our lives and uh, has allowed us to both preach the same gospel, and I thank the Lord for that. And it's been a blessing to see how God has used him, and I thank God for how he's using Brother Vincent, and to see God take his life and use him as a young man in the ministry. And I thank God for those two men, and uh, I've had the opportunity to meet Brother Daniel uh, Pearson, uh, be with him a couple times, and uh, thank God for him. And um, I'm so thankful that now I've had the opportunity to come here, this place that I've heard so much about, and now I can put faces with names. And, uh, and I appreciate, again, the kindness of the church. You've been very kind to us since we've been up here, and I want to say I, I appreciate that. Thank you. If you would, take your Bibles and open up to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 1. Hebrews, chapter number 1. I mentioned in the Sunday school hour that I've been not necessarily studying through the book of Hebrews systematically, but I've just been reading back through the book of Hebrews, and as things kind of stand out to me, I've taken the time just to, uh, to read over them, to study them, to kind of look at them and dig into these verses, and uh, it's been a help to me, and it's been an encouragement to my heart, and I hope that it will be a help to you as well this morning, but as the Lord has uh, shown some of these things to me, I've been preaching and preaching them back home and in the church there, and I uh, felt like this is what God has laid upon my heart this morning. So Hebrews chapter number one, if uh, you'd like to stand, we'll reverence the reading of the word of God together, Hebrews chapter number one, and we'll read the first three verses of chapter number one. <clears throat> God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, 
whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, uh, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Father, we bow before you this morning and thank you again for the word of God. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to stand and to proclaim the word of God, to proclaim the gospel once again. And I pray that Christ would be magnified, that he would have the preeminence, that all eyes would be fixed upon him. I pray that you would help us this morning as we look into thy word, grant us understanding. I pray, Father, if there are any here today that do not know you, that today would be the glad day that you would open their eyes that they might see, that you would draw them with bands and cords of love and you would bring them to saving faith in Christ. Father, we look to you now. We know that all is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One come down. And we ask you, Father, to direct us as we go further in this service and we'll thank you and we'll praise you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can be seated. Thank you for standing As we look here in Hebrews chapter number 1, I want to take the title of the text from the text itself. Verse number 2, again we read, He hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son. And I want to preach on that thought this morning, by His Son. I admit that I have nothing new to offer you this morning as we consider this text, but only to preach to you that grand old theme of Jesus, His person, His passion, and His power, His character, His crucifixion, and His coronation, His stoop, His sacrifice and His session at the right hand of the throne of majesty. This was the old subject of the first Christian ministers according to the Word of God. Daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. When Philip went down to the city of Samaria, he preached Christ unto them. When he sat with the Ethiopian eunuch in his chariot, he preached unto him Jesus. As soon as Paul was converted, straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues. Once we grasp the true value of our subject, then we shall not be ashamed not only to proclaim, but also to believe as well what the apostles preached and what martyrs and confessors testified of with their dying breath. And I hope to proclaim this glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ as long as I live, as long as as God will give me breath and give me strength and give me the mind to be able to do it. That's my desire. And I hope that when this generation of preachers has passed away, unless the Lord has come, that there will always be found a succession of men who shall determine to preach nothing save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And after all, this is the message which men need most of all. They may have other desires, they may seek other things, but nothing can satisfy the real need of their heart but Jesus Christ and salvation by His precious blood. He is the bread of life which came down from heaven. He is the water of life 
which if a man drinks, he shall never thirst again. And so it does us good to often dwell upon this theme, for it is most necessary to the sons of men. I've heard people say, and it's always bothered me, but I have heard people say, it may have been said about me, I don't know, I've heard it said about other preachers. All he ever does is preach that gospel. All he ever does is preach on Jesus. Well, what, pray tell, is there other than Jesus to preach? I have found that those who trust Jesus, those who love Jesus, Love to hear more and more about Him. It is the one theme that never grows old among the body of Christ. This is a subject which God the Holy Spirit is pleased to bless. Since when He, that is the Holy Spirit, is come... He shall testify of me, that is, Jesus Christ. And I'm sure that the Spirit honors most the preaching that most honors Christ. I thought about it this morning as I was thinking over the message and trying to get my thoughts together. I was reminded, I believe, Brother Brandon Harrell's the one that shared it with me. He heard an older preacher say it, said he told one time of two Welsh Preachers who were traveling down the road, both of them going to engagements to go preach the Word of God, and said they came to a split in the road. One had to go one way, one had to go the other way. And as they parted ways, one of them stopped and turned and he cried, Dear brother, may the countenance of God shine upon your preaching today. And the other brother stopped and he turned back and he said, I pray it so, but if not, I will speak well of him behind his back. My desire is to only speak well of Jesus Christ. My desire is that my life in some way, not just my preaching, but my life, my time allotted me will in some way honor and glorify the Lamb of God and exalt him before others. Try to set the text itself before you plainly so that we may all see clearly the subject himself. My subject is to be the Savior, the only Savior, the Savior who must save or else none will ever be saved and all shall perish. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. I'm about to speak of him. And I think that all who are aware of the necessity of being saved will want to hear about him. And to know how they may get to him. And how he may be their savior. Notice with me in the text who he is. There's a great deal said just in this short portion of Scripture concerning the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not possible that any language can fully express who Jesus is. Yet by the Holy Spirit's teaching, I would tell you what I know of him and who the text declares him to be. First, uh, Jesus is God's own Son. What do I know about that wondrous truth of God? If I were to try to explain it to you, the eternal Sonship, it would not take long before I would outstrip my feeble mind and my vocabulary and be completely out of my depth. Deity is not to be explained but to be adored, one man said. And the sonship of Christ is to be accepted as a truth of revelation. 
and to be comprehended by faith where it cannot be fully comprehended by understanding. There have been many attempts made by the early church fathers to explain the relationship between the two divine persons, the Father and the Son. And I would just adopt the language of the old creed, since I can't say it any clearer or any better than they did. Christ is God of God, light of light. Very God of very God. He is co-equal with the Father. Though how that is, uh, I don't fully understand. He stands in the nearest possible relationship to the Father. A relationship of great love and and delight. uh, So that the Father says of Him, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He is one with the Father, so that there is no separating them. As he himself said in reply to Philip's request, show us the Father. He said, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Let me just stop here and say to anyone who is in need of salvation, what a comfort it is that he who has come to save men, is divine. He is God. Because if He is God, then nothing is impossible with Him. Let me be careful here. I don't mean that Christ is merely a God amongst other gods. But He is deity itself. Christ Jesus is God. And being God, there can be no impossibilities. There cannot even be any difficulties with Him. How often do we look maybe at some that we know, some that possibly are amongst our family members, or maybe we look into our communities and we see certain ones, and in our minds we think, man, they're a hard case. I don't, I don't know what it would take to get a hold of that one. I don't, I don't know if it's even possible for that one to come to saving faith. Let me remind you that our Savior is God. There's not even any difficulties with Him. We look around and think, man, what a hard situation. Not for God. There is nothing outside of the ability of His hands. You may look at yourself and say, What circumstance do I find myself in now? This is an impossible situation. Not with God. Not with Christ. There are no difficulties with Him. Notice next that Jesus Christ is the heir of all things. In His person as the God-man, the Father has appointed Him to be heir of all things. What does this mean? But that Christ possesses all things as an heir possesses His inheritance. That Christ is Lord over all things. As an heir becomes Lord and ruler among his brethren. This shall be fully accomplished by and by. For now we see not yet all things put under him. Christ is Lord of all the angels. Not a single seraph spreads its wings. Except at the bidding of the heir of all things. There is no heavenly host unknown to us, that is beyond the control of the God-man. Christ Jesus and the fallen angels also are in subjection to His omnipotence. As for all things here below, natural and unnatural, men both quick and dead, 
God has given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as his Father has given him. He has put all things under his feet and the government shall be upon his shoulder. He is heir or master and possessor of all things. And let me say of all sorts of blessings and all forms of grace, for it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell. As surely as time marches on to eternity, and the minutes continue to tick down, the hour is coming when Christ shall be universally acknowledged as King of kings and Lord of lords. One day we shall hear the shouts go up from every part of this inhabited globe and from all heaven and all space. Hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. All must willingly or else unwillingly submit to His rule. For His Father has appointed Him heir of all things. We read in Philippians chapter 2, that very familiar portion of Scripture, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted Him, and given Him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is another great encouragement to any soul that is in need of salvation. For Christ holds in His hands everything necessary to save you. We find a Christ that is being offered men in this generation who is not the Christ of the Bible. He is a weak and an ineffectual Christ who needs the help of men to save themselves, but in reality, Jesus Christ is the heir of all things and He holds in His hands all power and all authority and all power is given Him over all flesh and He shall give eternal life to His people. Notice next that Jesus Christ is the Creator by whom also He made the worlds. However many worlds there are, I don't know. It may be true that there are worlds beyond our knowledge, filled with intelligent beings. And I find it much easier to believe that God's creation is vastly larger than this one poor little speck of dirt called earth in God's great universe than it is not to believe. But it matters not how many worlds there are or what inhabits them. I've had people worry themselves sick over whether there's going to be little green men flying around coming to this earth and what they were going to do when they got here. I say, preacher, are you worried about that? No. Preacher, do you believe? I don't know what's out there. But I know this, uh, if it exists, uh, it was made by Him uh, and it was made for Him. And I'm not worried about it. Let them do what they want to do. They're going to by and by bring glory and honor to their Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ. I love to think that He who created all things is also our Savior. That means that He can create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. How could it ever be possible that we could ever be made new creatures in Christ Jesus were it not that the Creator Himself were our Savior? But because He's our Savior, then I do not find it to be a hard thing at all that He could take you or He could take me and He could completely transform us and create us anew 
in Jesus Christ. He's up to the task. Christ created all worlds so he can make us new creatures by the wondrous power of his grace. See what a mighty Savior has been provided for every one of us. And never say, oh, I can't trust him. As I was studying and come across the testimony of Charles Spurgeon concerning a Mr. Hyatt. He said this, when Mr. Hyatt was asked on his deathbed, can you trust Christ with your soul? He answered, if I had a million souls, I could trust them all with him. And so may you. If you had as many souls as God ever created and if you had heaped upon you all the sins uh, that men have ever committed, uh, you could still trust Jesus Christ uh, who is the Son of God whom He has appointed heir of all things by whom also He made the worlds. Go a little further and see what Christ is next called the brightness of His Father's glory. What an amazing picture this is. Some commentators say, and it's not a bad figure, we have to be careful about taking any figure too far. But they say that as light is to the sun, so is Jesus to the glory of God. He is the brightness of that glory. That is to say, there's not any glory in God, but what is also shown forth in Christ. And when that glory reaches its highest point, when God the ever glorious is most glorious, that greatest glory is seen in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I understand. He laid aside the glories of heaven to come to this earth. I would remind you that thank God as we mentioned this morning that we see Jesus by faith. We no longer see Him suffering. We no longer see Him bearing reproach and shame. But we see Him highly exalted. We see Him magnified and glorified above all others. And we see in Christ the express image of God. He is the brightness of His Father's glory. Notice the next phrase there. And the express image of His person. One man said that as he approached this text, He felt compelled to remove the shoes from off his feet. For he felt as though he was standing on holy ground. As we approach the holy ground described by these words, the express image of his person, whatever God is, Christ is. The very likeness of God, the very Godhead of God, the very deity of deity is in Christ Jesus, the express image of His person. Christ is God manifesting Himself in His brightness. Now Christ being all this that Paul described, who would dare turn their back on such a Savior? You would have to be a fool to walk away, to deny, to reject such a Savior as this who holds within His hands all power, all dominion, and yet is so full of compassion and mercy that He would reach down to where you are and lift you up. Then it says this, and we'll move on. 
upholding all things by the word of his power. Think of it. This great world of ours is upheld by Christ's word. If he did not speak it into continued existence, it'd go back into nothingness from where it came. There exists not a single being who is independent of the mediator. By him all things consist. That is, they continue to hold together. Christ is holding all things created by Him together by the word of His power. And if He can do that, friend, I think that He is well able to hold you together. Say, preacher, my world's falling apart. My life is in pieces. It may feel like that. But you run to Jesus. and He has the power to hold you together. I've gone through things that I wouldn't even share with you this morning. You wouldn't understand them. There are things I went through. There's things probably you've gone through that if you tried to share it with me, it would just cheapen it because I wouldn't really understand the, the fullness and the weight of it. And I've gone through those things, and as I walked through that valley, I thought, this is going to be it. This is going to be the trouble. This is going to be the trial. This is going to be the circumstance. It's going to be my undoing. I don't see any way out of this. I don't see any way through this. And now I look back, and I see that God faithfully brought me through every one. When I could not see a way, when I could not imagine a solution, and I look back and see that God upheld me by the word of his power. He held my world together and brought me through. While I was falling apart, he had things well in hand. And I can trust him. And you can trust him. Notice with me, and we'll move along quickly, what he did. Who he is, but notice what he did. He who is all that that we have previously described did what? Let me just say, first, he effectually purged our sins. When he had by himself purged our sins. What wonderful words. There was never such a monumental undertaking as that since time began. No matter what great feats men can claim that they have done, you can look back through the writings of men, you can look back through mythology and see the trials of supposed great men and great gods from the imaginations of other men and yet men and yet none of them compare to the monumental task that Jesus took upon Himself when He took my sin and your sin and He bore it in His own body to the cross of Calvary. He that knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of Christ. Notice this. It's a wonderful thing that Christ purged our sins even before we had committed them. There they stood before the sight of God as already existing in all their hideousness. But Christ came and purged them. And this surely ought to make us... uh, Sing praises unto God. For He has washed away all of our sins. No doubt, 
there was a point in time when we must all come to saving faith. But the work was accomplished on the cross of Calvary by the Lord Jesus Christ. Further, the apostle says that Christ purged our sins by himself. That is, by offering himself as a substitute. There was no purging away of sin except Christ to bear the burden of it. And he did bear it. He bore all that was due to guilty man on account of his breaking the law of God. And God accepted his sacrifice as a full and equal payment. There's nothing left owing. On my account, on your account, he by himself purged our sins. The idea there's not so much that he was alone in doing it, although he was, but that he was the sacrifice in our stead. And thank God for that wonderful truth of the substitutionary sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is denied among many in this day, in this hour. Some have said that it is an old and an outdated doctrine. But it is a doctrine that I love and hold dear to my heart. That he died in my place. That he suffered in my stead. That he took my sins upon himself. And in turn robed me. In his righteousness. And he has taken those sins away. Let any believer, if he wants to see his sins, stand on his tiptoes and look up. Will he see them there? No. If he looks down, will he find them there? No. If he looks all around, will he see his sins anywhere? No. Say, oh, let him look within. Will he see them there? No. Where should he look then? Let him look where he likes. For he will never see his sins again. According to the ancient promise, In those days and in that time, says the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for and there shall be none and the sins of Judah and they shall not be found for I will pardon them whom I reserve. Can I tell you where your sins are? Christ purged them. And God said, I will cast all their sins behind my back. I don't know where that is since everything according to the scriptures is before God. Where is behind his back? I don't know, but all that I can figure is that my sins are in a place where God himself can never look upon them again. They are forever removed. They're gone. Friend, do you know what that feels like? Do you understand the freedom and the liberty that there is in that? Not to live how I want. Not to act how I want. Not to have a license to live in this world as one who is uh, free to partake in all the pleasures this world offers, but to be set free from the bondage of sin. To no longer have that sin guilt And that judgment hanging over my head to be free. You may only find that in Christ Jesus. Who by himself has purged our sins. And then let me say this lastly. Notice where he went. When he had by himself purged our sins. He sat down at the right hand. Of the majesty on high. There is an allusion here no doubt to the high priest. Who on the great day of atonement. When the sacrifice had been offered. Presents himself before God. And now Christ our great high priest. Having once and for all. 
offered himself as a sacrifice for sin, has now gone into the most holy place. And there he sits at the right hand of the majesty on high. Notice that. It implies rest. When the high priest went within the veil, he did not sit down. He stood with holy trembling, bearing the sacrificial blood before the blazing mercy seat. But our Savior now sits at His Father's right hand. The high priest of old had not finished His work. For next year, another atoning sacrifice would be needed. But our Lord has completed His atonement. And now there remains no more sacrifice for sin. For there remains no more sin to be purged. It's gone. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. There he sits. I'm sure he would not be sitting if he had not finished the work of salvation on the behalf of his people. Isaiah long before had been inspired to record what the Messiah would say. For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof goes forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burns. But Christ is now resting. And by faith I can see Him sitting there So I know that as one man penned these words, love's redeeming work is done, fought the fight, the battle won. And Christ also sits in the place of honor at the right hand of the majesty on high. It is the highest place that heaven affords. And it is His by right. He is King of kings, He is Lord of lords, and He is heaven's eternal light. Not only does Jesus sit in the place of honor, He occupies a place of safety. None can hurt Him now. None can stop His purposes. None can defeat His will. He is at the powerful right hand of God in heaven, Above and on the earth beneath uh, shall be broken with a rod of iron. He shall dash them to pieces uh, like a potter's vessel. And so his cause is safe. His kingdom is secure. For he is at the right hand of power. Let me just say this lastly. Christ at the right hand of God signifies the eternal certainty of his reward. It's not possible that he should be robbed of the purchase of his blood. I cringe when I hear some speak as though Christ shall be disappointed or about his having died trying to accomplish something that he didn't even know would come to pass. Dying for something which the will of man might give him or might deny him. I don't purchase anything on such terms as that. Do you? If I go in to make a purchase, I expect to get what I pay for. If I don't get what I pay for, I go back. And I show them, look, I paid for this. I want this. Let me just say, Christ will have what he bought with his own blood. Especially as he lives again to claim his purchase. He shall have all those whom he has purchased. 
He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Therefore let us say hallelujah. And fall down and worship him. I'm convinced of this. There will not be a day in eternity when the Lord Jesus shall look over the blood-bought redeemed and say, I really hope they'd have been more of them. I tried my best. I wanted to present a bride before my father, but this is all I could get. No. That's foolishness. Thank God the day will come. Though we can't number them down here, we can't even pick them out down here. But thank God one day we'll all be gathered together over there. And we'll all sing a new song. And our tune will be, Worthy is the Lamb who hath redeemed us by His own blood people from every corner of this earth. Brothers and sisters that you've never met, you never laid eyes on. All different colors and nationalities and from all different places all gathered together around that throne worshiping one God and magnifying the Lamb of God who shed his own blood to save them from their sins. That's where he is. With a Savior like that, so glorious, and yet so compassionate, how could any man continue on in his rebellion and his unbelief? And oh, that God would open your heart and open your eyes to see and to receive the Lamb of God who can take away your sin. If you've been saved by the grace of God, oh, child of God, rejoice in what you have and who you are in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God all of this is by His so, Father, I thank you for your word today. I pray you would take it and use it. Lord, get glory and honor to thyself. I pray that Christ would be altogether lovely to every soul that is in this place. And I pray, Father, that you would take your word and use it however you see fit. In Jesus' name, amen.